Chapter 1 of Rainy Week This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Glenn Coster, Jr. Rainy Week by Eleanor Halliwell Abbott Chapter 1 in the changes and chances of our New England climate, it is not so much what a guest can endure outdoors as what he can originate indoors that endears him most to a weather-worried host. Take Rollins, for instance. A small man, dour, insignificant, a prude in the moonlight, a duffer at sailing, a fool at tennis, yet... Once given a rain patter in a smoky fireplace of an audacity so impertinent, so altogether absurd, that even yawns must of necessity turn to laughter, or curses. The historic thunderstorm question, for instance, which he sprang at the old bishop's house party after five sweltering days of sunshine and ecclesiastical argument, who was the last person you kissed before you were married? A question innocent as milk if only swallowed, but unswallowed, gurgled, spat like venom from bishop to bishop, and from bishop's wife to bishop's wife. Oh, la! Yet that Rollins himself was the only unmarried person present on that momentous occasion shows not at all, I still contend, the slightest natural mendacity of the man, but merely the perfectly normal curiosity of a confirmed anchor to learn what truths he may from those who have been fortunate or unfortunate enough to live. Certainly neither my husband nor myself would ever dream of running a house party without Rollins. Yet equally certain, it is not at all on Rollins' account, but distinctly on our own, that we invariably set the date for our annual house party in the second week of May. For twenty years, in the particular corner of the New England seacoast which my husband and I happen to inhabit, it has never, with one single exception only, failed to rain from morning till night and night till morning again through the second week of May. With all weather uncertainties thus settled perfectly, definitely, even for the worst, it is a comparatively easy matter for any host and hostess to stage such events as remain. It is with purely confessional intent that I emphasize that word stage. Every human being acknowledges, if honest, some one supreme passion of existence. My husband's and mine is for what highbrows call the experimental drama. We call it amateur theatricals. Yet even this innocent passion has not proved a serene one. After inestimable seasons of devotion to that most ruthless of all goddesses, the goddess of amateur theatricals, involving, as it does, wrangles with guests who refuse to accept unless they are assured that there will be a play, wrangles with guests who refuse to accept unless assured that there will not be a play, wrangles with guests already arrived, unpacked, tubbed, seated at dinner, who discover suddenly that their lines are too long, wrangles with, guests already arrived, unpacked, tubbed, seated at dinner, who discover equally suddenly that their lines are too short, wrangles with, guess who can't possibly play in blue, wrangles with, guess who can't possibly play in pink, wrangles with, Guests who insist upon kissing in every act. Wrangles with. Guests who refuse to kiss in any act. It was my husband's ingenious idea to organize instead an annual play that should never dream it was a play, acted by actors who never even remotely suspected that they were acting, evolving a plot that no one but the Almighty himself could possibly foreordain. We call this play Rainy Week. Yet do not, I implore you, imagine for a moment that by any such simple little trick as shifting all blame to the weather, all praise to the Almighty, care has been eliminated from the enterprise. 
It is only indeed at the instigation of this trick that the real hazard begins. For a play, after all, is only a play, be it humorous, amorous, murderous, adulterous, a soap bubble world combusting spontaneously of its own effervescence. But life is life and starkly real, if not essentially earnest and the merest flicker of the merest eyelid in one of life's real emotions has short-circuited long ere this with the eternities themselves. It's just this chance of short-circuiting with the eternities that shifts the pucker from a host's brow to his spine. No lazy, purring reunion of old friends this rainy week of ours, you understand. No dully congenial convocation of inbred relatives, no conference on literature, music, painting, no symposium of embroidery stitches, nor of billiard shots, but the deliberate and relentlessly planned assemblage of such distinctly diverse types of men and women as prodded by unusual conditions of weather, domicile, and propinquity will best act and react upon each other in terms inevitably dramatic though most naively unrehearsed. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. Very considerable psychologic as well as dramatic satisfaction is now at last ours, confess your humble servants. In this very sincere, if somewhat whimsical dramatic adventure of rainy week, the exigencies of our household demand that the number of actors shall be limited to eight. Barring the single exception of husband and wife, no two people are invited who have ever seen each other before. Destiny plays very much more interesting tricks we have noticed with perfect strangers than she does with perfect friends. Barring nothing, no one is ever warned that the week will be rainy. It is astonishing how a guest personality strips itself right down to the bare sincerities when he is forced unexpectedly to doff his extra-selected, super-fitting, ultra-becoming visiting clothes for a frankly nondescript costume, chosen only for its becomingness to a situation. In this connection, however, it is only fair to ourselves to attest that following the usual managerial custom of furnishing from its own pocket such costumes, as may not for bizarre or historical reasons be readily converted by a cast to street and church wear, we invariably provide the rainy week costumes for our cast. This costume consists of one yellow oilskin suit or slicker, one yellow oilskin hat, one pair of rubber boots, one dark blue jersey, and very warm woolen stockings. Reverting also to dramatic sincerity, no professional manager certainly ever chose his cast more conscientiously than does my purely whimsical husband. After several years of experiment and readjustment, the ultimate cast of Rainy Week is fixed as follows. A bride and groom, one very celibate person, someone with a past, someone with a future, a singing voice, a May girl, and a boar. Rollins, of course, figuring as the boar. Always there must be that bride and groom for the celibate person to wonder about, and the very celibate person for the bride and groom to wonder about. Male or female, one brave soul who had rebuilt ruin. Male or female, one intrepid brain that dares to boast of having made tryst with the future. Soprano, alto, bass, or tenor, one singing voice that can rip the basting threads out of serenity. One young girl, so may blossomy fresh and new, that everybody instinctively changes the subject when she comes into the room. And Rollins. To be indeed absolutely explicit, experience has proved with an almost chemical accuracy that quite regardless of age, sex, or previous condition of servitude, this particular combination of Romantic passion, psychic austerity, tragedy, ambition, poignancy, innocence, and irritation cannot be housed together for even one rainy week without producing drama. 
But whether that drama be farce or fury, whether he who came to star remains to sup, who yet shall prove the hero, and who the villain, who? Oh, la, it's God's business now. All the more reason, affirms my husband, why all such details as light and color effects, eatments, drink mints, and guest room reading matter should be attended to with extra conscientiousness. Already through a somewhat sensational motor collision in the gay October Berkshires, we had acquired the tentative bride and groom, Paul Brinswick and Victoria Meredith, as ardent and unreasonable a pair of young lovers as ever rose unscathed from a shivered racing car to face, instead of annihilation, a mere casual separation of months, until such May time as Paul himself, returning from heaven knows what errand in China, should mate with her and meet with us. And to New York City, of course, one would turn instinctively for the someone with the future, at a single round of studio parties in the brief Thanksgiving holiday, we found Claude Killenworth. Not a moment's dissension occurred between us concerning his absolute fitness for the part. He was beautiful to look at, and not too young, twenty-five perhaps, the approximate age of our tentative bride and groom. And he made things with his hands, in dough, clay, plaster, anything he could reach, very insolently, all the time you were talking to him, modeling the thing he was thinking about instead. I would just wait till you see him in bronze, thrilled all the young satellites around him. Till you see me in bronze, thrilled young Killingworth himself. Never in all my life have I beheld anyone as beautiful as Claude Killingworth, with a bit of brag in him. That head, sharply uplifted, the pony-like forelock swished like smoke across his flaming eyes. The sudden, wild pulse of his throat. Heavens, what a boy! You artist fellows are forever reproducing solids with liquids, remarked my husband quite casually. All the effects, I mean. All the illusion. Crag or cathedral? out of a dime-sized mud puddle in your watercolor box. Flesh you could kiss from a splash of turpentine. But can you reproduce liquids with solids? Could you put the ocean into bronze, I mean? The ocean? screamed the satellites. No mere skinny bas-relief, mused my husband. Of the front of a wave hitched to the front of a wharf, or the front of a beach, but waves corporally complete and all alone, shoreless, skyless, like the model of a village and ocean rolling all alone, as it were in the bulk of its three dimensions? In bronze, questions young Killenworth. Bronze? His voice was faintly raspish. Oh, it wasn't a blue ocean, especially that I was thinking about, confided my husband, genially, through the mist of his cigarette. Any chance pick-up acquaintance has seen the ocean when it's blue. But my wife and I, you understand, we live with the ocean. Call it by its first name. Oh, ocean. And all that sort of thing. He smiled out abruptly above the sudden sharp spurt of a freshly struck match. The, the ocean I was thinking of, he resumed with an almost exaggerated monotone, was a brown ocean, brown as boiled seaweeds, mad as mud under a leaden sky, seething, souring, perfectly lusterless, every brown billow topped, pinched up as though by some malevolent hand into a vivid, vertigrous bruise. But however in the world would one know where to begin, giggled the satellites. 
or how to break it off so it wouldn't end like the edge of a tin roof. Even if you started all right with a nice molten wave, what about the last wave? The problem of the horizon sense. Yes, what about the horizon sense? shouted everybody at once. From the shadowy sofa pillowed corner just behind the supper table, young Killenworth's face glowed suddenly into view. But a minute before, I could have sworn that a girl's cheek lay against his. Yet now, as he jumped to his feet, the feminine glove that dropped from his fidgety fingers was twisted with extraordinary maliciousness, I noted, into a doll-sized caricature of a vamp. I could put the ocean into bronze, Mr. DeVille, he said, if anybody would give me a chance. Perhaps it was just this very ease and excitement of having booked anyone as perfect as young Killenworth for the part of someone with the future that made me act as impulsively as I did regarding Ann Walter. We were sitting in our room in a Washington hotel before a very smoky fireplace one rather cross night in late January when I confided the information to my husband. Oh, by the way, Jack, I said quite abruptly, I've invited Ann Walter for Rainy Week. Invited whom? questioned my husband above the rim of his newspaper. Ann Walter, I repeated. Ann what? persisted my husband. Ann Walter, I reemphasized. Who's she? quickened my husband's interest very faintly. Oh, she's a woman, I explained or a girl, that I've been meeting most every day this last month at my hairdresser's. She runs the accounts there or something, and tries to keep everybody pacified, and reads the darndest books, all highbrow stuff. You'd hardly expect it. Oh, not modern highbrow, I mean. Essays as body as novels, but the old serene highbrow. Emerson and Pater and Wordsworth, Books that smell of soap and lavender, as well as brains. Reads them as though she liked them, I mean. Comes from New Zealand, I've been told. Really, she's rather remarkable. Must be, said my husband, to come all the way from New Zealand to land in your hairdresser's library. It isn't my hairdresser's library, I corrected with faint disparity. It's her own library. She brings the books herself to the office. And just what part, drawled my husband, is this New Zealand paragon, Miss Stolter, to play in our rainy week? Walter, I corrected quite definitely. Ann Walter. Wardrobe mistress, teased my husband. Or she is going to play the part of the someone with the past. I said, What? cried my husband. His face was frankly shocked. What? he repeated blankly. The most delicate part of the cast, the most difficult, the most hazardous, it seemed best to you, without consultation, without argument, to act so suddenly in the matter, and so, so all alone, I had to act very suddenly, I admitted. If I hadn't spoken just exactly the minute I did, she would have been off to Alaska within another 48 hours. Mmm, mused my husband, and resumed his reading. But the half inch of eyebrow that puckered above the edge of his newspaper loomed definitely as a sample of a face that was still distinctly shocked. When he spoke again, I was quite ready for his question. How do you know that this Ann Walter has got a past? He demanded. How do we know young Killenworth's got a future? I counterchecked. Because he makes so much noise about it, I suppose, admitted my husband. By which very same method, I grinned. I deduct the fact that Ann Walter has got a past, inasmuch as she doesn't make the very slightest sound whatsoever concerning it. 
You can see no personal reticence in the world? quizzed my husband. Yes, quite a good deal, I admitted. But most of it, I honestly believe, is due to sore throat. A normal throat keeps itself pretty much lubricated, I've noticed, by talking about itself. Herself, corrected my husband. Himself, I compromised. But this Ann Walter has told you that she came from New Zealand, scored my husband. Oh, no, she hasn't, I contradicted. It was the hairdresser who suggested New Zealand. All Ann Walter has ever told me was that she was going to Alaska. Anybody's willing to tell you where he's going. But the person who never tells you where he's been, the person who never by word, deed, or act correlates today with yesterday? The here with the there? I've been home with her twice to her room. I've watched her unpack the Alaska trunk. Not a thing in it older than this winter. Not a shoe, nor a hat, nor a glove that confides anything. No scent of Ferba Psalm left over from a summer vacation. No photograph of sister or brother. Yet it's rather an interesting little room, too. Awfully small and shabby after the somewhat plushy splendor of the hairdressing job. But three or four really erudite English reviews on the table. A sprig of blue larkspur thrust rather negligently into a water glass and a man's blue larkspur in January, demanded my husband. How, how old is this, this Walter person? Oh, uh, twenty-five, perhaps, I shrugged. With a gesture of impatience, my husband threw down his paper and began to poke to fire. Oh, pshaw, he said. Is our whole dramatic endeavor going to be wrecked by the monotony of everybody being twenty-five? Well, call it thirty-five if you'd rather, I conceded. Or a hundred and five. Ann Walter wouldn't care. That's the remarkable thing about her face. I hastened with some fervor to explain. There's no dating on it. This calamity that has happened to her, whatever it is, has wrung her face perfectly dry of all contributive biography except the mere structural fact of at least reasonably conservative birth and breeding. A little bit abruptly, my husband dropped the fire tongs. You like this Ann Walter, don't you? he said. I like her tremendously, I acknowledged. Tremendously as a person, and tremendously for the part. I insisted. Yet there's something about it that worries you, quizzed my husband not amiably. There is, I said. Just one thing. She's got a broken tooth. With a gesture of real irritation, my husband sank down in his chair again and snatched up the paper. It was ten minutes before he spoke again. Is it a front tooth? He questioned without lifting his eyes from the page. It is... I said. When my husband jumped up from his chair this time, he showed no sign at all of ever intending to return to it. As he reached for his hat and coat and started for the door, he tried very hard to grin, but the effort was poor. This was no marital disagreement, but a real professional shock. I simply can't stand it, he grinned. One's prepared, of course, for a tragedy queen to sport a broken heart. But when it comes to a broken tooth... Wait till you see her, I said. There was nothing else to say. Wait till you see her. Even with the door closed behind him, he came back once more to tell me how he felt. Oh, he shivered. Oh... Truly, if we hadn't gone out together the very next day and found George Keats, I don't know what would have happened. Depression still hung very heavily over my husband's heart. Here it is, almost February, he brooded. And even with all we've got, we're still short the celibate and the singing voice and the May girl. It was just then that we turned the street corner and met George Keats. What? Why, the celibate of all persons, 
we both gasped as if in a single breath and rushed upon him. Now it may seem a little strange instead of this that we have never thought to feature poor Rollins as the celibate, to double him, as it were, as the celibate and bore, conserving thereby one by no means an expensive outfit of waterproof clothes, twenty-one meals, a week's wash, and heaven knows how many rounds of scotch at a time of imminent draught. But Rollins, though as far as anybody knows, a bachelor and eminently chaste, is by no means my idea of a celibate. Oh, not Rollins. Not anybody with a mind like Rollins. For Rollins, poor dear, would marry every day in the week if anybody would have him. It's the other people who have kept Rollins virgin. But George Keats, on the other hand, is a good deal of a fascinator, in spite of his austerity, perhaps indeed because of his austerity. Tall, lean, good-looking, extravagantly severe, 38 years old, and a classmate of my husband at college. Whether life would ever succeed or not in breaking down his unaccountable intention never to mate, that intention, physical, mental, moral, psychic, call it whatever you choose, was stamped indelibly and for all time on the curiously incongruous granite-like finish of his originally delicate features. Life had at least done interesting historical things to George Keats's face. "'Oh, George!' cried my husband. "'I thought you were in Egypt digging mummies.' "'I was,' admitted George, without any further palaver of greeting. "'When did you get back?' cried my husband." And what are you doing now? And where are you going to be in May? I interpose with perfectly uncontrollable interest. Why, I'm just off the boat, you know, brightened George. A drink would be good, of course. But first, I'd just like to run into the library for a minute to see if they put in any new thrillers while I've been gone. There's a corking new book on Arch Cellars that ought to be due about now. On what, what? I stammered. Oh, well, fossil cats, you know, and all that sort of thing, explained George chivalrously. But of course you, Miss Deville, he hastened now to appease me, would heaps rather hear about Paris fashions I know. So if you people really should want me in May, I'll try my best, I promise you, to remember every latest wrinkle of lace or feather. Only, of course, he explained with typical conscientiousness, in the museums and the libraries, one doesn't see just, of course, the... On the contrary, Mr. Keats, I interrupted hectically. There is no subject in the world that interests me more, at the moment, than mummies. And by the second week in May, that interest will have assumed proportions that... Shh, admonished my husband. But really, George, he himself hastened to cut in. If you could come to us the second week in May. May? considered George. Second week? Why, certainly I will. And bolted for the library while my husband and I, in a perfectly irresistible impulse, drew aside on the curbing to watch him disappear. Equally unexplainable, three totally non-concerned women turned also to watch him. It's his shoulders, I ventured. The amazing virility of his shoulders contrasted with the stingingness of his smile. Stingingness nothing, snapped my husband. Devil take him. He may, yet, I mused as we swung into step again. So now we had nothing to worry about, or rather no uncertainty to worry about, except the May girl and the singing voice. The singing voice, my husband argued might be picked up by good fortune at most any cabaret show or choral practice. Not any singing voice would do, of course. It must be distinctly poignant. But even poignancy may be found sometimes where you least expect it. Some reasonably mature, faintly disappointed sort of voice, usually lilting with unquestionable loveliness, just the side of real professional success. But where in the world do we find a really ingenious ingenue? 
They don't exist anymore, I asserted. Gone out of style like the teddy bear. Old engine news, you see, of course, sometimes sweet and precious and limp as old teddy bears. But a brand new engine new? Don't you remember the awful search we had last year? And even then, maybe you're right, worried my husband. And then the horrid attack of neuralgia descended on poor Mr. Husband so suddenly, so acutely, that we didn't worry at all about anything else for days. And even when that worry was over, instead of starting off gaily together for the Carolinas as we had intended, to search through steam-heated corridors and green velvet golfways and jessamine-scented lanes for the May girl, my poor husband had to dally at home instead in a very cold, slushy, and disagreeable city to be x-rayed, tooth-pulled, ear-stabbed, and everything but bertilland while I, for a certain business reason, went on ahead to meet the spring. But even at parting, it was the dramatic anxiety that worried my husband most. Now don't you dare do a thing this time, he warned me, until I come. Look around all you want to, get acquainted, size things up. But if ever two people needed to work together in a matter, it's in this question of choosing a May girl. Whereupon, in an impulse quite as amazing to himself as to me, he went ahead and chose the May girl all by himself. Before I had been in the Carolinas three days, the telegram came. Have found May girl. Success beyond wildest dreams. Doubles with singing voice. Absolute miracle. Explanations. Himself and the explanations arrived a week later. Himself, poor dear, was rather depleted, but the explanations were full enough to have pleased anybody. He had been waiting, it seems, on the day of the discovery an interminably long time in the doctor's office. All around him, in the dinginess and general irritability of such an occasion, loomed the bulky shapes of other patients who, like himself, had also been waiting interminable eons of time. Everybody was very cross, and it was snowing outside. One of those dirty gray late winter snows that don't seem really necessary. And when she came, just a girl's laugh at first from the street door, an impish prance of feet down the dark, unaccustomed hallway. A little trip on the threshold, and then personified, laughing, blushing, stumbling fairly headlong at last into the room, the most radiantly lovely young girl that you have ever had the grace to imagine, dangling exultantly from each frost-pinked hand a very large, wriggly, and exceedingly astonished rabbit. Oh, Uncle Charles, she began, see what I've found, and in an ash barrel, too, in a... She blinked the snow from her lashes, took a sudden startled glance around the room, another at the clock, and collapsed with confusion into the first chair that she could reach. A very tall little girl she was, and very young, not a day more than eighteen, surely and even in the encompassing bulk of her big coonskin coat with its broad arms hugging the brown rabbits to her breast, she gave an impression of extraordinary slimness and delicacy, an impression accentuated perhaps by a slender silk stocking dankle, the frilly cuff of a white sleeve, and the aura of pale gold hair that radiated in every direction from the brim of her coonskin hat. For fully fifteen minutes, my husband said she sat huddled up in all the sweet furry confusion of a young animal, till driven apparently by that very confusion to essay some distinctly normal-appearing, everyday gesture, she reached out impulsively to the reading table and picked up a book, which some young man had just relinquished rather suddenly at the summons to the doctors in her office. Relaxing ever so slightly into the depths of her chair with the bunny's noses twinkling contentedly to the rhythm of her own breathing, she made a wonderful picture, line, color, spirit, everything of youth. 
reading with that strange, extra, inexplainable touch of the sudden little pucker in the eyebrows. Sheer intellectual perplexity was in that pucker. But when the young man returned from the inner office, he did not leave at once, as every cross, irritable person in the room hoped that he would, but fidgeted around instead with hat and coat, stamped up and down, crowding other people's feet, and elbowing other people's elbows. With a gaspy glance at his watch, he turned suddenly on the girl with the rabbits. "'Excuse me,' he floundered, "'but I have to catch a train. Please, may I have my book?' "'Your book?' deprecated the girl. Confusion and new overwhelmed her. "'Your book? Why, I beg your pardon. Why, why?' Pink as a rose, she slammed the covers and glanced for the first time at the title. The title of the book was, What Every Young Husband Should Know. With a sigh like the sigh of a breeze in the ferns, the tension of the room relaxed. A very fat, cross-looking woman in black satin ripped audibly at a side seam. A frail old gentleman, who really had very few laughs left, wasted one of them in the smoldering depths of his big, black-bordered handkerchief. The lame newsboy on the stool by the door emitted a single snort of joy. Then the doctor himself loomed suddenly from the inner office and started right through everybody to the girl with the rabbits. Why, May, he laughed. I told you not to get here till four o'clock. Oh, not May, I protested to my husband. It simply couldn't be. Not really. Yes, really, affirmed my husband. Isn't it the limit? But wait till you hear the rest. She's Dr. Braun's ward, it seems, and has been visiting him for the winter. Comes from some little place way off somewheres. And she's got one of those sweet, clear, absolutely harrowing boy soprano type of voices that sound like incense and altar lights, even in ragtime. But weirder than anything, triumphed my husband. Oh, not than anything, I gasped. But weirder than anything, persisted my husband, is the curious way she's marked. M marked I stammered. Yes. After I saw her with her hat off, said my husband, I saw the mark. I've seen it in a few boys before, but never in a girl. An absolutely isolated streak of gray hair, in all that riot of blondness and sparkle and youth. Just as riotous, just as lovely, a streak of gray hair. It's bewitching, bewildering, like May itself. Now sunshine, now cloud. You'll write to her immediately, won't you? He begged. And to Dr. Braun, too? I told Dr. Braun quite frankly that it was going to be rather an experimental party. But that, of course, we'd take the best possible care of her. And he said he'd never seen an occasion yet when she wasn't perfectly capable of taking care of herself. And that he'd be delighted to have her come. Laughed my husband quite suddenly. If we were sure that we didn't mind animals. Animals? I questioned. Yes. Dogs, cats, birds, explained my husband. It isn't apt to be a large animal, such as a horse or a cow. Dr. Braun was kind enough to assure me. But he never knew her yet, he said, to arrive anywhere without a guinea pig, squirrel, broken-winged bat lame dove, or half-choked mouse that she had acquired on the way. She's very tender-hearted and younger than... Blankly for a moment, my husband and I sat staring into each other's eyes. Then, quite impulsively, I reached over and kissed him. Oh, Jack, I admitted. It's too perfect. Truly, it makes me feel nervous. Suppose she should roll her hoop off the cliff, or... Or blow out the gas, chuckled my husband. So you see now, our cast was all assembled. Radiant, 
unctuous, impatient Paul Brunswick and Victoria Meredith for the bride and groom, George Keats for the very celibate person, Anne Wolter for the someone with the past, Claude Killingworth for the someone with the future, May Davies for the May girl and the singing voice, and Rollins for the boar. About Rollins, I must now confess that I have not been perfectly frank. We hire Rollins. How else could we control him? Even with a mushroom mind like his, fruiting only in bad weather, one can't force him on one's guests morning, noon, and night. Very fortunately here, for such strategy as is necessary, my husband concedes one further weakness than what I have previously designated as his passion for amateur theatricals and his tolerance of me. That weakness is seashells, mollusca, you know, and that sort of thing. From all over the world, smelling saltily of coral and palms, iceberg or arctic, and only too often, alas, of their dead cells, these smooth, spiky, pink, blue, yellow, or mottled shells arrive with maddening frequency. And Rollins is a born cataloger. What easier thing in the world to say than, Oh, by the way, Rollins, old man, here's an invoice that might interest you from a Florida key that I've just located. How about the second week in May? Could you come then, do you think? I'm all tied up, to be sure, with a house full of guests that week, but they won't bother you any. And at least you'll have your evenings for fun. Clothes? Haven't got them? Oh, pshaw. Let me see. It rained last year, didn't it? Well, I guess we can raise the same umbrella that we raised for you then. So long. Everything settled then. Everything ready but the springtime and the scenery. And God himself at work on that. Hist! What is it? The flash of a bluebird? A bell tinkles, a pulley rope creaks, and the curtain rises. End of this section. Recording by Glenn Coster, Jr. Chapter 1 Continued of Rainy Week by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Glenn Coster, Jr. Chapter 1 Continued May always comes so amazingly soon after February, so infinitely much sooner than anyone dares hope that it would. Peering into snow-smeared shop windows some rather particularly bleak morning, you notice with half a contemptuous sort of amusement a precocious display of ginghams and straw hats. And before you can turn around to tell anybody about it, tulips have happened, and it's May. More than seemingly extravagantly early this year, May dawned also with extravagant lavishness. Through every prismatic color of the world, Sunshine sang to the senses. What shall I do, fretted my husband, if this perfection lasts? The question indeed was a leading one. The scenery for rainy week did not arrive until the afternoon of the 8th. From his frowning survey of bright lawns, gleaming surf, radiant sky, I saw my husband turn suddenly with a little gasping sigh that might have meant anything. What is it? I cried. Look, he said. It's come. Silently, shoulder to shoulder, we stood and watched the gigantic storm bales roll into the sky, packed in fleece, corded with ropes of mist, gorgeous, portentous, tomorrow's rain. It is not many hosts and hostesses, under like circumstances, who turned to each other as we did with a single whoop of joy. An hour later, hatless and coatless in the lovely warm May twilight, we stood by the larch tree waiting for our guests. 
We like to have them sup in town at their own discretion or indiscretion that first night, and all arrive together reasonably sleek and sleepy and totally unacquainted on the eight o'clock train. But the larch tree has always been our established point for meeting the rainy week people. Conceding cordially the truth of the American aphorism that while charity may perfectly legitimately begin at home, hospitality should begin at the railroad station. We personally have proved beyond all doubt that for our immediate interest at stake, dramatic effect begins at the entrance to our driveway. Yet it is always with mingled feelings of trepidation and anticipation that we first sense the blurry rumble of motor wheels on the highway. If the station bus were only blue or green, but palest oak, and shuddered like a roll-top desk, spilling out strange personalities at you like other people's ideas brimming from pigeonholes, for some unfathomable reason of constraint this night, no one was talking when the bus arrived. Shy, stiff-spined, non-communicative, still questioning, perhaps, who was who and what was what. These seven guests, who by the return ride a week hence might even be mated, such things have happened, or once more not speaking to each other, this also has happened loomed now like so many dummies in the gloom. Why, hello, we cried, jumping to the rear step of the bus as it slowed slightly at the curb and thrusting our faces as genially as possible into the dark, unresponsive doorway. Hello, rallied someone. I think it was Rollins. Whoever it was, he seemed to be having a terrible time trying to jerk his suitcase across other people's feet. Oh, is this where you live? questioned George Keats's careful voice from the shadows. The faintest possible tinge of relief seemed to be in the question. Here? brightened somebody inside. A window fastener clicked, a shutter crashed, an aperture opened, and everybody all at once, scenting the sea, crowded to stare out where the gray dusk merging into gray rocks merged in turn with the gray rocks into a low, rambling, gray fieldstone house, silhouetted with indescribable weirdness at the moment against that delicate, pale gold, French drawing-room sort of sky cluttered so incongruously with the clump of dark clouds. The road doesn't go any farther? puzzled someone. There's no other stopping place, you mean? Just a little bit further along? This is the end? The last house? The... High from a cliff top somewhere, a seabird lifted a single eerie cry. Oh, how... how dramatic, gasped somebody. Reaching out to nudge my husband's hand, I collided instead with the dog's cold nose. Followingly, apparently the same impulse, my husband's hand met the dog's startling nose at almost the same instant. Except for a second's loss of balance on the bus step, neither of us resented the incident. But it was my husband who recovered his conversation as well as his balance first. Oh, you, Miss Davies, he called blithely into the bus. What's your palm's name? Nosegay? Skip about? Cross patch? What? Lucky for you, we knew your propensity for arriving with pets. The kennel's all ready, and the cat sent away. In the nearest shadow of all, it was almost as though one heard an ego bristle. I beg your pardon, but the Pomeranian is mine, affirmed Claude Killenworth's unmistakable voice with what seemed like quite unnecessary hauter. "'What the deuce is the matter with everybody?' whispered my husband. With a jerk and a bump, the bus grazed a big boulder and landed us wheezingly at our own front door. As expeditiously as possible, my husband snatched up the lantern that gleamed from the doorstep and, brandishing it on high, 
challenged the shadowy occupants of the bus to disembark and proclaim themselves. Ann Walter stepped down first. As vague as the shadows, she merged from her black-garbed figure, faded unoutlined into the shadow of the porch. For an instant only, the uplifted lantern flashed across her strange, stark face, and then went crashing down into a shiver of glass on the gravelly path at my husband's feet. And Stolter, I heard him gasp. My husband is not usually a fumbler either with hand or tongue. In the brightening flare of the flashlight that someone thrust into his hands, his face showed frankly rattled. Anne Walter, I prompted him hastily. For the infinitesimal fraction of a second, our eyes met. I hope my smile was as quick. What is the matter with everybody? I said. With extravagant exuberance, my husband jumped to help the rest of our guests alight. Hi there, everybody. He greeted each new face in turn as it emerged somewhat hump-shouldered and vague through the door of the bus into the flare of his lantern light. Poor Mr. Rollins, of course, tumbled out. Fastidiously, George Keats illustrated how a perfect exit from a bus should be made. Suitcase, hat box, English ulster, everything a model of its kind. Even the constraint of his face, absolutely perfect. With the Pomeranian clutched rather drastically under one arm, Claude Killingworth followed Keats. All the time, of course, you knew that it was a Pomeranian who was growling, but from the frowning irritability of young Killingworth's eyes, one might almost have concluded that the boy was a ventriloquist and the palm a puppet instead of a puppy. Her name is Pet, he announced somewhat succinctly to my husband, and she sleeps in no kennel, a trifle paler than I had expected, but inexpressibly young, lovely, palpitant, and altogether adorable, the May girl sprang into my vision and my arms. Her heart was beating like a wild bird's. With the incredibility of their miracle still stamped almost embarrassingly on their faces, our bride and groom of a week completed the list. It wasn't just the material physical fact that love was consummated that gave them that look, but the spiritual amazement that love was consummatable. No other look in life ever compasses it, ever duplicates it. It made my husband quite perceptibly quicken the tempo of his jocity. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, he enumerated. All good guests come straight from heaven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, he repeated, as though to be perfectly sure. Seven? Why, why, what the... He interrupted himself suddenly. With frank bewilderment, I saw him jump back to the rear step of the bus and flash his light into the farthest corner, where the huddled form of an eighth person loomed weirdly from the shadows. It was a man, a young man, and at first glimpse he was quite dead, but on second glimpse merely drunk, hopelessly, helplessly sodden drunk, with his hat gone, his collar torn away, his haggard face sagging like some broken thing against his breast. With the tension suddenly relaxed, a faint sigh seemed to slip from the group outside. In the crowding faces that surrounded us instantly, it must have been something in young Killenworth's expression, or in the Pomeranian's, that made my husband speak just exactly as he did. With his arms held under the disheveled, uncouth figure, he turned quite abruptly and scanned the faces of his guests. And whose little pet may this be? he asked trenchantly. From the shadow of the port cure, somebody laughed. It was rather a vacuous little laugh. Sheer nerves. Rollins, I think. Framed in the half-shuttered window of the bus, the May girl's face pinked suddenly like a flare of apple blossoms. He, he came with me, 
said the May girl. No matter how informally one chooses to run his household, there is almost always some one rule of notice on which the smoothness of that informality depends. In our household, that rule seems to be that no explanations shall ever be asked either in the darkness or by artificial light, it being the supposition, I infer, that most things explain themselves by daylight. Perfectly, cordially, I can see that they usually do, but some nights are a great deal longer to wait through than others. It wasn't on this particular night that anyone refused to explain, but that nobody even had time to think of explaining. The young stranger was in a bad way, not delirium tremens or anything like that, but a fearful alcoholic disorganization of some sort. The men were running up and down the stairs half the night. Their voices rang through the hall in short, sharp orders to each other. No one else spoke above a whisper. With silly comforts like talcum powder and hot water bottles and sweet chocolate and new novels, I put the women to bed. Their comments, if not explanatory, were at least reasonably characteristic. From a swirl of pink chiffon and my best blankets, with her ear cocked quite frankly toward a step on the stairs, her eyes like stars, her mouth all a kiss, the bride reported her own emotions in the matter. No, no one, of course, had ever believed for a moment, the bride assured me, that the drunken man was one of the guests. And yet, when he didn't get off at any of the stops and this house was so definitely announced as the end of the road, why it did, of course, make one feel just a little bit nervous, flushed the bride, perfectly, irrelevantly, as the creak on the stairs drew near. Ann Walter registered only a very typical indifference. A great many different kinds of things, she affirmed, were bound to happen in any time as long as a day, one simply had to get used to them, that was all. She was unpacking her somber black traveling bag as she spoke, and the first thing she took out from it was a man's gay, green-plaited golf cap. It looked strange with the rest of her things. All the rest of her things were black. I never thought I would succeed in putting the May girl to bed. With a sweet sort of stubbornness, she resisted every effort. The first time I went back, she was kneeling at her bedside to say her forgotten prayers. The second time I went back, she had just jumped up to write a letter to her grandfather. Something about the sea, she affirmed, had made her think of her grandfather. It was a long time, she acknowledged, since she had thought of her grandfather. He was very old, she argued, and she didn't want to delay any longer about writing. Slim, and frank as a boy in her half-adjusted blanket wrapper dishable, she smiled up at me through the amazing mop of gold hair, with the gray streak floating like a cloud across the sunshine of her face. She was very nervous. She must have been nervous. It darkened her eyes to two blue sapphires. It quickened her breath like the breath of a young fawn running. And would I please tell her... How to spell oceanic? She implored me, as though answering intuitively the unspoken question on my lips. She shrugged blame from her as some exotic songbird must have shrugged its first snow. No, she didn't know who the young man was. Truly, as far as she knew, she had never, never seen the young man before. O C E A N I C, was it? The rain was not actually delivered until one o'clock in the morning. Just before dawn, I heard the storm bales rip in sheets of silver and points of steel with rage and roar and a surf like a picture in a Sunday supplement. The weather broke loose. Thank heaven the morning was so dark that no one appeared in the breakfast room an instant before the appointed hour of nine. George Keats, of course, appeared exactly at nine, very trim, very distingué, 
in a marvelously tailored gray flannel suit and absolutely possessed to make his own coffee. Claude Killingworth's morning manner was very frankly peevish. His room had a tin roof, and he hardly thought he should be able to stand it. Rain? Did you call this rain? It was a flood. Were there any movie palaces near? And were they open mornings? And he'd like an underdone chop, please, for the Pomeranian. And it wasn't his dog anyway, darn the little fool, but belonged to the girl who had the studio next to his, and she was possessed with the idea that a week at the shore would put the pup on its feet again. Women were so blame temperamental. If there was one thing in the world that he hated, it was temperamental people. And all the time he was talking, he wasn't making anything with his hands, because he wasn't thinking anything instead. And how in creation, he scolded, did we ever happen to build a house out on the granite edge of nowhere? How did we stand it? How? Hi there. Wait a moment. God, what form! That wave with the tortured top. Hush. Don't speak. Please leave him alone. Breakfast? Not yet. When a fellow could watch. Ah, uh, a thing like that. For heaven's sake, pass him that frothy edge napkin. Did anybody mind if he tore it while he watched that other froth tear? Dear, honest, ardent, red-blooded Paul Brinswick came down so frankly interested in the special device by which our house gutters took care of such amazing torrents of water that everybody felt perfectly confident all at once that no bride of his would ever suffer from leaky roofs or any other mechanical defect. Paul Brinswick liked the rain just as much as he liked the gutters, and he liked the sea, and he liked the house, and he liked the sky, and he liked everything. Even when a clumsy waitress joggled coffee into his grapefruit, he seemed to like that just as much as he liked everything else. Paul Brinswick was a real bridegroom. I am not, I believe, a particularly envious person, and have never, as far as I knew, begrudged another woman her youth, or her beauty, or her talent, or her wealth. But if it ever came to a chance of swapping facial expressions, just once in my life, some very rainy morning, I wish I could look like a bridegroom. But the expression on the bride's face was distinctly worried. Joy worried. Any woman who had ever been a bride could have read the expression like an open book. Victoria Brinswick had not counted on rain. Moonlight, of course, was what she had counted on. Moonlight, day and night in all probability, and long, sweet, soft stretches of beach, and cavernous rocks, and incessantly mirthful escapades of escape from the crowd, but to be shut up all day long in a house full of strange people, with a bridegroom who after all was still more or less of a strange bridegroom? The panic in her face was almost ghastly. The panic of the perfectly happy. The panic of the person hanging over ecstatically on the absolute perfection of a singer's prolonged high note, driven all at once to wonder if this is the moment when the note must break. To be all alone and bored on a rainy day is no more than anyone would expect. But to be with one's lover and have the day prove dull? If God in the terrible uncertainty of him should force even one dull day into the miracle of their life together? Ann Walter, dragging down to breakfast just a few minutes late, had not noticed, especially, it seemed, that the day was rainy. She met my husband's eyes as she met the eyes of her fellow guests, calmly, indifferently, and with perfect sophistication. If his presence or personality was in any way a shock to her, she certainly gave no sign of it. The May girl didn't appear till very late, so late, indeed, that everyone started to tease her for being such a sleepyhead. Her face was very flushed, her hair in a riot of gold and gray, 
her appetite like the appetite of a young cannibal. Across the rim of her cocoa cup, she hurled a lovely defiance at her traducers. Sleepyhead, she exulted. Not much. Hadn't she been up since six, and out on the beach, and all over the rocks, way, way out to the farthest point? There was such a heavenly suit of yellow oilskins in her closet. She hoped it wasn't cheeky of her, but she just couldn't resist them. And the fishes, the poor, poor little bruised fishes, dashed up by that terrible surf on the rocks. She thought she never, never would get them all put back. They kept coming and coming so, every new wave flopping, flopping. Rollins's breakfast had been sent to his room. You yourself wouldn't have wanted to spring Rollins on anyone quite so early in the day. And with my best breakfast tray, my second best china, and sherry and the grapefruit, there was no reason, certainly, why Rollins in any way should feel discriminated against. Surely, as far as Rollins knew, every guest was breakfasting in bed. Even without Rollins, there was quite enough uncertainty in the air. Everyone was talking, talking about the morning. I mean, not about yesterday morning, most certainly not about yesterday night. Babble, chatter, draw, laughter, the voices rose and fell. Breakfast indeed was just about over, when a faint stir on the threshold made everybody look up. It was the drunken stranger of the night before. Heaven knows he was sober enough now, but very shaky. Yet collarless as he was, and still unshaven, our men had evidently not expected quite so early a resuscitation. He loomed up now in the doorway, with a certain tragic poise and dignity that was by no means unattractive. Why, hello, said everybody. Hello, said the stranger. With a palpable flex of muscle, he leaned back against the wainscoting of the door and narrowed his haggard eyes to the cheerful scene before him. I don't know where I am, he said, or how I got here, or who you are. I can't seem to remember anything. The faintly sheepish smile that quickened suddenly in his eyes, if not distinctly humorous, was at least plucky. I think I must have had a drink, he said. I wouldn't wonder, grinned Paul Brinswick. You are perfectly right, conceded George Keats. Have another, suggested my husband. A straight and narrow this time. You look wobbly. There's nothing like coffee. And still the stranger stood undecided in the doorway. I'm not very fit, he acknowledged. Not with ladies, but I had to know where I was. Blinking with perplexity, he stared and stared at the faces before him. I'm three thousand miles from home, he worried. I don't know a soul this side of the Sierras. I, I don't know how it happened. Ah, oh, shucks shrugged young Killingworth. Easiest thing in the world to happen to a stranger in a new town. Welcome to our city. Welcome to our city from night till morning and morning till night again. Any crowd wants to get started. Crowd? brightened the stranger. I, I was in some sort of, uh, a crowd? He rummaged hopefully through his poor bruised brain. From her concentrated interest in a fried chicken bone, the May girl glanced up with her first evidence of divided attention. Yes, you were, she confided genially. It was at the railroad junction, and when the officer arrived, he said, I hate like the dickens to run this gentleman in, but if there's nobody to look after him. So I said you belong to me. I saw the crepe on your sleeve said the May girl. Crepe on my sleeve, stammered the stranger, 
with a dreadful gesture of incredulity he lifted his black banded arm into vision it was like watching a live heart torn apart to see his memory waken my god he gasped my god still wavering but with a really heroic effort to square his stricken shoulders he swung back toward the company. His face was livid, his voice barely articulate. Over face and voice lay still that dreadful blight of astonishment. But when he spoke, his statement was starkly simple. I, I buried my wife and unborn child yesterday, he said, in a strange land among strangers i i more quickly than i could possibly have imagined it george keats was on his feet beckoning the stranger to the place where he himself had just vacated and with his hands on the stranger's shoulders he bent down suddenly over him with a curiously twisted little smile welcome to our pity said george keats between Paul Brinswick and his bride, there flashed a sharp glance of terror. It was as though the bride's heart had gasped out. What if I have to die some day, and this day was wasted in rain? I saw young Killingworth flush and turn away from that glance. I saw the May girl open her eyes with a new baffled sort of perplexity. It was then that Rollins came puttering in, grinning like a cheesy cat, with his half-demolished breakfast sliding round rather threateningly on his ill-balanced tray. The strange exultancy of rain was in his eye. "'I thought I heard voices,' he beamed. "'Merry voices!' With mounting excitement, he began to beat tunes with his knife and fork, upon the delicate porcelain dome of his toast dish am i a king he began to intone that i should call my own this struck suddenly by the somewhat strained expression of ann walter's face he dropped his knife and fork and fixed his eye upon her for the first time with an unmistakable intentness how did you break your tooth beamed Rollins. End of chapter one. Recording by Glenn Coster, Jr. Chapter two, part one of Rainy Week by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Lee. For a single horrid moment, everybody's heart seemed to lurch off into space, to land only too audibly in a gaspy thud of dismay. Then, Anne Waltor, with unprecedented presence of mind, jumped up from the table and ran to the mirror over the fireplace. Only the twittering throat muscle reflected in that mirror belied for an instant the sincerity of either her haste or astonishment. Broken tooth! she protested incredulously why have i got a broken tooth people acknowledged their mental panic so divergently my husband acknowledged his by ramming his elbow into his coffee cup claude kenilworth lit one cigarette after another the may girl started to butter a picture postcard that someone had just passed her Quite starkly before my very eyes, I saw the sober stranger, erstwhile drunken, reach out and slip a silver salt shaker into his pocket. Meeting his glance, my own nerves exploded in a single hoot of mirth. Into the unhappy havoc of the stranger's face, a rather sick but very determinate little smile shot suddenly. Well, I certainly am rattled, he acknowledged. His embarrassment was absolutely perfect. Not a whit too much, not a whit too little, at a moment when the slightest under-emphasis or over-emphasis of his awkwardness would have stamped him ineradicably as either boor or bounder. 
more indeed by his chair's volition than by his own he seemed to jerk aside then and there from any further responsibility for the incident turbid as the storm at the window his eyes racked back to the eyes of his companions surely he besought us there must be some place some hotel somewhere in this town where i can crawl into for a day or two till i can yank myself together again taking me in this way from the streets or worse the way you people have along the stricken pallor of his forehead a glisten of sweat showed faintly from my eyes to my husband's eyes and back to mine again he turned with a sharply impulsive gesture of appeal how do you people know but what i am a burglar he demanded even so i suggested blithely can't you see that we'd infinitely rather have you visiting here as our friend than boarding at the hotel as our foe the mirthless smile on the stranger's face twitched ever so faintly at one corner you really believe then he quickened that there is honour among thieves all proverbs intercepted my husband a bit abruptly are best proved by their antithesis we do at least know that there is at times a considerable streak of dishonour among saints eh what's that i didn't quite catch it beamed the bridegroom but my husband's entire attention seemed focused rather suddenly on the stranger so you'd much better stay right on here where you are he adjured him with some accent of authority where all explanations are already given and taken ourselves quite opportunely short one guest and long one guest room and no i won't listen for a moment to its being called an imposition protested my husband not for a moment only of course i must admit he confided genially above the flare of a fresh cigarette that it would be a slight convenience to know your name my name flushed the stranger why of course it's alan john you mean john allen corrected the may girl very softly no insisted the stranger it's alan john quite logically he began to rummage through his pockets for the proof it's written on my bill folder he frowned it's in my check-book it's written on no end of envelopes with his face the colour of half-dead sedge-grass he sank back suddenly into his chair and turned his empty hands limply outward as though his wrist bones had been wrung gone he gasped stripped everything there you have it i babbled hysterically now how do you know but what we are burglars this whole house a den of thieves the impeccable mr george keats there at your right no more no less than exactly what he looks an almost perfect replica of a stage raffles eh what's that bridal george keats dragging you here to this house the way we did i found her desperately quite helpless as you were so so spifflicated prompted the may girl the word on her lips was like the flutter of a rose petal with a little gasp of astonishment young kenilworth rose from his place and dragging his chair in one hand his plate of fruit in the other moved round to the may girl's elbow to finish his breakfast like a palm trying to patronize a pine tree his crisp exotic young ego swept down across her young serenity really i don't quite make you out he said i think i shall have to study you study me reflected the may girl make a lesson about me you mean on a holiday the vaguely dawning dimple in her smooth cheek faded suddenly out again the stranger alan john it seemed was rising from the table if you'll excuse me i think i'll go to my room he explained i'm still pretty shaky i'm but halfway to the stairs as though drawn by some irresistible impulse he turned and fumbling his way back across the dining-room opened the big glass doors direct into the storm tripping ever so slightly on the threshold he lurched forward in a single wavering step 
in an instant the may girl was at his side her steadying hand held out to his recovering his balance almost instantly he did not however release her hand but still holding tight to it indescribably puzzled indescribably helpless stood shoulder to shoulder with her staring out into the tempestuous scene lashed by the wind the may girl's mop of hair blew gold blue gray across his rain-drenched eyes blurred in a gusty flutter of white skirts his whole tragic sagging figure loomed suddenly like some weird symbolic shadow against the girl's bright beauty frankly the picture startled me Shh, warned my husband it won't hurt her any he doesn't even know whether she's young or old or a boy or a girl interposed george keats a bit dryly or a nymph or a saint grinned young kenilworth or or anything at all persisted my husband except that she says kindness and nothing else you notice except just kindness no suggestions you observe no advice and at an acid moment in his life of such unprecedented shock and general nervous disorganization when his only conceivable chance of comeback perhaps hangs on the alkaline wag of a strange dog's tail or the tune of a street piano proving balm not blister by to-morrow i think you won't see him holding hands with the may girl nor with any other woman personally confided my husband a bit abruptly i rather like the fellow even in the worst of his plight last night there was a certain fundamental sort of poise and dignity about him as of one who would say bad as this is you chaps must see that i'd stand ready with my life to do the same for you to do the same for you gasped the bride very quietly like an offended young princess she rose from the table and stood for that single protesting moment with her hand on her bridegroom's shoulder her eager academic face was frankly aghast her voice distinctly strained i'm sorry she said but i quite fail to see how the word dignity could possibly be applied to any man who had so debased himself as to go and get drunk because his wife and child were dead you talk said my husband as though you thought getting drunk was some sort of jocular sport it isn't that is not inevitably you know no i didn't know murmured the bride coldly deplorable as the result proved to be interposed george keats smooth carefully modulated voice it's hardly probable i suppose that the poor devil started out with the one deliberate purpose of of debasing himself as mrs brunswick calls it no questioned the bride it isn't exactly you mean as though he'd leapt from the church shouting yo ho and a bottle of rum observed young kenilworth with one faintly twisted eyebrow shh admonished everybody maybe he simply hadn't eaten for days suggested my husband or slept for nights and nights frowned george keats and just absolutely was obliged to have a bracer said my husband to put the bones back onto his knees again so that he could climb up the steps of his train and fumble some sort of way to his seat without seeming too conspicuous whatever religion may do you know to starch a man's soul or stiffen his upper lip he's got to have bones in his knees if he's going to climb up into railroad trains and our poor young friend here it would seem merely miss miscalculated mused kenilworth how many knees he had paul wouldn't do it flared the bride do what demanded young kenilworth hush protested everybody make a beast of himself if i died if i died persisted the bride pray excuse me for contradicting either your noun or your preposition apologized my husband 
but even at its worst i'm quite willing to wager that the only thing in the world poor alan john started out to make was an oblivion for himself an oblivion scoffed the bride yes even for one night persisted my husband even for one short little night before the horror of three hundred sixty-five nights to the year and god knows how many years to the life rang on again some men really like their wives you know some men so no matter how thin-skinned and weak this desire for oblivion seems to you quickened my husband it is at least a paul wouldn't frowned the bride in the sudden accentuation of strain everybody turned as quickly as possible to poor paul to decide as cheerfully as seemed compatible with good taste just what that gorgeously wholesome-looking specimen of young manhood would or would not do probably under suggested circumstances nobody certainly wanted to consider the matter seriously yet nobody with the bride's scared eyes still scorching through his senses would have felt quite justified i think in mere shrugging the issue aside no i don't think paul would rallied my husband with commendable quickness not with those eyes not with that particular shade of crisp controlled hair complexions like his aren't made in one generation of righteous nerves and digestions oh no even in the last ditch the worst thing paul would do would be to stalk round putting brand new gutters on a brand new house bridge building is my job not gutters grinned paul unhappily stalk round building brand new bridges corrected my husband intoxicated with bridges triumphed young kenworth doped with specifications but perhaps alan john doesn't know how to build bridges murmured my husband and perhaps in alan john's family an occasional maiden aunt or uncle has strayed just a with the faintest possible gesture of impatience but still smiling the bridegroom rose from the table and lifted his bride's hand very gently from his shoulder who started this conversation anyway he quizzed i did laughed everybody well i ended said the bridegroom oh thunder protested young kenilworth in the hollow of his hand something that once had been the spongy shapeless centre of a breakfast roll crushed back into sponge again but in the instance of its crushing crude as the modelling was half just half child's play i sensed the unmistakable parody of a woman's fingerprints bruising into the soft crest of a man's shoulder even in the absurdity of its substance the sincerity of the thing was appalling catching my eye alone young kenilworth gave an amused but distinctly worldly wise little laugh women do care so much don't they he shrugged a trifling commotion in the front hall stayed the retort on my lips the commotion was anne waltor coated and hatted and already half gloved she loomed blackly from the shadows trying very hard to attract my attention in my twinge of anxiety about the may girl i had quite forgotten anne waltor and in the somewhat heated discussion of alan john's responsibilities and irresponsibilities the may girl also it would seem had passed entirely from my mind i'm very sorry explained anne waltor but with this unfortunate accident to my tooth i shall have to hurry of course right back to town even if you had never heard anne waltor speak you could have presaged perfectly from her face just what her voice would be like gravely contralto curiously sonorous absolutely without either accent or emphasis yet carrying in some strange inexplainable way a rather goose-fleshy sense of stubbornness and finality one can't exactly in a christian land droned anne waltor go round looking like the sole survivor of a massacre 
across the somewhat sapient mutual consciousness that ever since we had first laid eyes on each other five months ago and goodness knows how long before that she had been going round perfectly serenely looking like the sole survivor of a massacre Anne Walter and I stared just a bit deeply into each other's eyes. The expression in Anne's eyes was an expression of peculiar poignancy. No, of course not, I conceded with some abruptness. But surely, if you can find the right dentist and he's clever at all, you ought to be able to get back here on the 6.30 train tonight. The 6.30 train? Perhaps murmured Anne Walter. Once again, her eyes hung upon mine. And I knew, and Anne Walter knew, and Anne Walter knew that I knew, that she hadn't the slightest intention in the world of returning to us on any train whatsoever, but for some reason, known only to herself, and perhaps one other, was only too glad to escape from our party, anatomically impossible as that escape sounds, through the loophole of a broken tooth. Already both black gloves were fastened, and her black travelling bag swayed lightly in one slim, determinate hand. Your maid has ordered the station bus for me, she confided, and tells me that by changing cars at the junction and again at Lee's, truly I'm sorry to make any trouble, she interrupted herself, if there had been any possible way of just slipping out without anybody noticing— "'Without anybody noticing,' I cried. "'Why, Anne, you dear silly!' At this, my first use of her Christian name, she flashed back at me a single veiled glance of astonishment and started for the door. But before I could reach her side, my husband stepped forward and blocked her exit by the seemingly casual accident of plunging both arms rather wildly into the sleeves of his great city-going raincoat, why the thing is absurd he protested you can't possibly make train connections and there isn't even a covered shed at the junction if this matter is so important i'll run you up to town myself in the little closed car across anne waltor's imperturbable face an expression that would have meant an ingrowing scream on any other person's countenance flared up in a single twitching lip muscle and was gone again behind the smiling banter in my husband's eyes she also perhaps had noted a determination quite as stubborn as her own why if you insist she acquiesced but it had always distressed me more than i can say to inconvenience anybody inconvenience nothing beamed my husband ordinarily speaking my husband would not be described, I think, as having a beaming expression. With a chug like the chug of a motorboat, the little closed car came splashing laboriously round the driveway. Its glassy face was streaked with tears. Depressant as black life preservers, its two extra tires gleamed and dripped in their jetty enamel cloth casings. A jangle as of dungeon chains, clanked heavily from each fresh revolution of its progress. Everybody came rushing helpfully to assist in the embarkation. My husband's one remark to me flung back in a whisper from the steering wheel, though frankly confidential, concerned Alan John alone. Don't let Alan John want for anything today, he admonished me keep his body and mind absolutely glutted with bland things like cocoa and reading aloud, and don't wait supper for us. With her gay jonquil-colored oilskin coat swathing her somber figure, Anne Walter slipped into the seat beside him and slammed the door behind her. Her face was certainly a study. Sixty miles to town if it's an inch. How... Cozy, mused young Kenilworth. Goodbye, shouted everybody. Goodbye, waved Anne Woltor and my husband. As for Rollins, he was almost beside himself with pride and triumph. 
shuffling joyously from one foot to the other he crowded to the very edge of the vestibule and with his small fussy face turned up ecstatically to the rain fairly exploded into speech the instant the car was out of earshot she'll look better gloated Rollins. who the car deprecated young kenilworth then because everybody laughed out at nothing it gave me a very good chance suddenly to laugh out at nothing myself and most certainly i had been needing that chance very badly for at least the last fifteen minutes because really when you once stopped to consider the whole thrilling scheme of this rainy week play and how you and your husband for years and years had constituted yourself a very eager earnest-minded audience of two to watch how the lord almighty the one unhampered dramatist of the world would work out the scenes and colours the exits and entrances the plots and counterplots of the material at hand it was just a bit astonishing to have your husband jump up from his place in the audience and leap to the stage to be one of the players instead it wasn't at all that the dereliction worried your head or troubled your heart but it left your elbow so lonely who was there left for your elbow to nudge when the morning curtain rose on a flight of seagulls slashing like white knives through a sheet of silver rain or the night scene set itself in a plushy black fog that fairly crinkled your senses when the leading lady's eyes narrowed for the first time to the leading man's startled stare and the song you had introduced so casually at the last moment in the last act proved to be the reforming point in the villain's nefarious career and the one character you had picked for a comic relief turned out to be the tragedienne who in the world was left for your elbow to nudge swinging back to the breakfast room i heard the clock strike ten only ten it was going to be a nice little play all right starting off already with several quite unexpected situations and it wouldn't be the first time by any means that in an emergency i had been obliged to double as prompter and stagehand or water carrier and critic but how to double as elbow nutter i couldn't quite figure let's go for a tramp on the beach suggested the bridegroom always on the first rainy morning immediately after breakfast some restive business man suggests a tramp on the beach frankly we have reached a point where we quite depend on it for a cue everybody hailed the proposition with delight except alan john and rollins a zephyr would have blown alan john from his footing and rollins had to stay in his room to catalogue shells rollins was paid to stay in his room and catalogue shells of the five adventurers who essayed to sally forth only one failed to clamour for oilskins you couldn't really blame the bride for her lack of clamouring the bride's trousseau was wonderful as all trousseau are bound perforce to be that are made up of equal parts of taste money fashion and passion no one who had saved up such a costume as the bride had for the first rainy day together could reasonably be expected to doff it for yellow oilskins of some priceless foreign composition half cloth half mist indescribably shimmering almost indecently feminine with the frenchiest sort of a little hat gaily concocted of marsh grass and white rubber pond lilies it gave her lovely somewhat classic type all the sudden audacious effect somehow of a waterproofed valentine young kenilworth sensed the inherent contrast at once beside you he protested we look like yellow telegrams your husband there is some broker's stock quotation sent collect mr keats is a rather heavily worded summons to address the alumni of something or other college i am a lunch invitation to miss dancy prancy of the sillies and you of course miss davies he quickened delightedly are a night letter because you are so long and inconsequent all about rabbits and puppies and giddy things like checked gingham pinafores laughing teasing arguing jeering each other's oilskins praising the bride's splendour they swept a young hurricane of themselves 
out into the bigger hurricane of sea and sky and still five abreast still jostling still teasing still arguing passed from sight around the storm-swept curve of the beach while i stood behind to read aloud to alan john not that alan john listened at all but merely because every time i stopped reading he struggled up from the lovely soggy depths of his big leather chair and began to worry we read two garden catalogues and a chapter on insect pests we read a bit of walter potter and five exceedingly scurrilous poems from a volume of free verse it seemed to be the latin names in the garden catalogues that soothed him most and when we weren't reading we drank malted milk alan john it seemed didn't care for cocoa but even if i hadn't had alan john on my mind i shouldn't have gone walking on the beach we have always indeed made it a point not to walk on the beach with our guests on the first rainy restive morning of their arrival in a geographical environment where every slushy step of sand every crisp rug of pebbles every wind-tortured cedar root every salt gnawed crag is as familiar to us as the palms of our own hands it is almost beyond human nature not to try and steer one's visitors to the preferable places while the whole point of this introductory expedition demands that the visitors shall steer themselves in the inevitable mood of uneasiness and dismay that overwhelms most house-party guests when first thrust into each other's unfamiliar faces the initial gravitations that ensue are rather more than usually significant to be perfectly explicit for instance people who start off five abreast on that first rainy walk never come home five abreast in the immediate case at hand nobody came home at all until long after alan john and i had finished our luncheon and in the matter of that coming george keats had gravitated to leadership with the bride and bridegroom very palpably with the bridegroom's assistance he seemed to be coaxing and urging the bride's frankly jaded footsteps while young kenilworth and the may girl brought up the rear staggering and lurching excitedly under the weight of a large and somewhat mysteriously coloured wooden box the bridegroom and george keats and young kenilworth and the may girl were as neat as yellow paint but the poor bride was ruined tattered and torn her diaphanous glory had turned to real mist before the onslaught of wind and rain her hat was swamped her face streaked with inharmonious colours she was drenched to the skin her bridegroom was distracted with anxiety and astonishment everybody was very much excited lured by some will-o'-the-wisp but that lurks in waves and beaches they had lost their way it seems between one dune and another staggered up sand-hills fallen down sand-hills sheltered themselves at last during the worst gust of all in a sort of a cave in a sort of a cliff and sustained life very comfortably thank you on some cakes of sweet chocolate which george keats had discovered most opportunely in his big oilskin pockets but most exciting of all they had found a wreck yes a real wreck a perfectly lovely beautiful and quite sufficiently gruesome real wreck the may girl reported 